Noted. So we begin by acknowledging the First Nations people of this region as the traditional custodians of the land on which the Diocese of Gippsland serves. And we pay our respects to past, present and emerging elders of the Gunai Kurnai, Bunwurrung, Bidawal and Narago Monero peoples. We also acknowledge the traditional custodians of other lands represented here tonight. And we welcome the Anglican Bishop of Gippsland, the Right Reverend Richard Trelaw, our speaker, Jonathan Cornford, and everyone else who's attending tonight. So let's begin with a prayer. Loving and creative God, thank you for drawing us together tonight. We pray that you will spark new ideas and teach us new wisdom through your servant, Jonathan and inspire us to put these into practice for the good of your world and the glory of your name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. So we are here for the third webinar in this series organized by ACTING, which is Acting on Climate Together in Gippsland. The purpose of these seminars is to continue the momentum on climate action in Gippsland and to inspire and equip Gippsland Anglicans for that action. So I am delighted to introduce Jonathan Cornford, whom I have worked with occasionally over the years. Um, great to see you again, Jonathan. Yeah, and pleasure thank, to be thank, here. Yeah, thank you for presenting to us tonight. We're looking forward to it very much. Jonathan is co-founder of Managum, a ministry in good news economics. The twofold purpose of Managum is to help Christians reclaim an understanding of the Bible's teaching on material life and to help translate that teaching into the context of our complex global economy. Jonathan has a doctorate in political economy and a background in international development. He's also currently completing a doctorate in theology. He lives with his wife and two daughters in Bendigo where they are members of the Seeds community in the disadvantaged suburb of Long Gully. They are also members of the Common Rural Christian Network. We're delighted to have you with us, Jonathan, and look forward to what you have to tell us about food in a changing climate. So without further ado, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, folks. A uh, pleasure to be here. Um, great to find groups like yours uh, trying to think hard about the challenges of climate change from a faith perspective. So I'm always very keen to, to talk uh, with people like you. Um, so the topic I've been given to talk about tonight, I'm just going to share my screen to get that going. I've got some slides to show with this. The topic um, I've been given to talk about is securing food in a changing climate and really um, what we're going to be doing tonight is um, thinking about our food system uh, and what the challenges are for it and what that means for where it's going to need to go uh, given that climate change is happening and it's going to continue to happen. Uh, so and I'm working within a framework of roughly 20 minutes maybe a little bit more which is tight and when we're talking about food systems, um, as you'll see, we actually end up talking about a lot of things all together. So I'm going to be, um, I'm really going to talk top uh, at top level stuff. I'm going to talk about food system, and my real my emphasis is going to be on where we need to go with the food system uh, overall. So it's going to be really the top level headline stuff I'm thinking about, and. Almost every point that I bring up is going to, in itself, has a whole bunch of detail that requires a lot more uh, drilling down, really. But uh, we're not going to get down to a lot of that tonight. And, and I think that's helpful because uh, I think sometimes what we really need, particularly in a time when people are struggling for hope, is to have a sense of a bigger picture that we can, uh, that is realisable and that we can work towards. Um, so that's my framework anyway. Uh, I, it's At least that's the way I think. Uh, hopefully, I hope it's helpful for you too. Um, you can let me know in the discussion uh, whether you find it helpful or not. But um, I'm going to be, we're going to be doing big picture systems thinking. 
Uh, just to mention there on the, the, the photo in that uh, on that uh, first slide is my daughter's a uh, long time ago now, uh, um, uh, holding up some garlic that from our garden. Um, and really, I put that there as well as being a, a cute picture. Um, because, you know, when we think about this uh, subject, I mean, for, for, for me and for many others, really, we're thinking about the next generations uh, and the sort of world that they're going to live into. Um, and that's right at the heart of this topic. So I just want to start by uh, saying something which I'm not sure if this would be striking to you or not, but uh, I want to make a very uh, simple statement that the Bible anticipates climate change. Uh, or I could put another way and say the Bible explains it. Um, now, I run whole seminars on this topic, on, on the ecological frameworks of the Bible, and I'm not going to go into it tonight because um, we've got other fish to fry. Uh, but I think that's worth uh, saying that a lot of people have thought about climate change as some have felt, particularly Christians, have felt it somehow implicitly challenges their faith framework. Uh, and actually, uh, from my perspective, the more if we read our Bibles more and understood, paid attention to the instruction and the warnings in the Bible, uh, then we would see in climate change Nothing particularly surprising, actually, uh, something that just which rather validates the worldview that the Bible has been trying to describe to us. And there's a great quote, quote from the prophet Jeremiah, uh, which captures a lot of it. Um, but the Bible is rich with stuff that 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 really is relevant to our topic. But we won't talk about that tonight. Uh, so when we're talking about food, food affects everything. Uh, so when we're talking about food systems, we are really going to end up talking about a lot of other stuff as well, and that's unavoidable. Um, Wendell Berry, the great American uh, agrarian philosopher and poet, uh, has written a lot of stuff on food, but this is one of his classic statements that eating is an agricultural act. Uh, and in particular, uh, the ways the the forms of eating that we do, how we eat, what we eat, and the forms of agriculture that we have are closely bound together. Uh, so how we eat affects our agriculture and our agricultural affects how we eat. Uh, and we've tended to think uh, in for a long time now in when we think about economies, agriculture is often represented a fairly low uh, rung in people's thinking about what's important in, in an economy. But actually, um, what Wendell Berry is trying to draw our attention to is that it is is foundational. It's different from most other economic activities in that it is what we all depend upon, uh, and we need to become much clearer about how foundation, how foundational agriculture is to everything else. Actually, of course, food systems are much more than just agricultural systems, though. They are economic systems and political systems and social systems. And there are massive questions around equity and justice when we're thinking about food from locally, from within any given small Australian town, right through to global uh, relations around food between affluent countries like ours uh, and those of the developing world. Um, so we're talking about really big things, um, I'm going to focus primarily. Uh, rec so we need to recognise this is a global challenge. Uh, I'm my thinking from here on in is going to be primarily thinking about Australia, how we what how we think about our challenges. But we need to recognise we're part of a much bigger picture. Um, and that little um, uh, graphic down below gives you a, a striking. Uh, Cap strikingly captures some of the challenges we have around inequity around food. It's actually a, it's a, a bit old now, and I suspect that the two million uh, dying from malnutrition is is this year going to be a lot higher than that. So I'll, I won't go over this quickly. My hunch is that you're prob if you're people who are uh, in a group on climate change, you probably aren't get this already that climate change. Uh, promises massive disruption to our food systems. In fact, not promises, it's already happening. It's been happening for a little while now. Uh, and the, the sorts of the ways it does this is 
all sorts of things, but especially by uh, changing rainfall patterns, not just less rainfall, but could be more heavy rainfall in, in more intense, intense periods, warmer temperatures and how that affects various plant growth, uh, changed seasonality. Um, I, I don't know about you, but our, some of our fruit trees have gone a bit bonkers this year. Um, increased incidence of flood, drought and fire. And we're seeing that around the world. And those pictures that you can see, one's a picture of the, the uh, floods in Pakistan recently and the 2020 uh, bushfires in Australia, of which Gippsland had a very uh, dire taste of. Um, and also new pest profiles with changing uh, heat and weather patterns. So um, it's big stuff we're talking about. We won't dwell on that, but uh, I've written here the likely effects, but actually these effects are happening now. They're already happening, a rising food insecurity uh, that will drive and already is driving large scale people movement. Uh, uh, we see that particularly uh, across the Mediterranean and Africa, but we've seen it in our part of the world as well. That's going to increase as the century uh, goes on. That's only going to get bigger uh, and probably um, increasing geopolitical instability as well. I don't want to dwell on that, but um, uh, yeah, I'm sure most people are aware of that at some level. So I want to spend most of our time thinking about where we need to go. Uh, and here I'm going to predominantly be thinking from an Australian perspective because um, that at least is the, the context which we might feel that we have, you know, as citizens of this country, we have some level of agency <laughs> uh, or participation at least in, in the processes that, that go on um, or are a higher level. So, and I think, think that's useful. So, where we need to go with uh, massive disruption in food systems uh, and what that means ecologically, uh, the first thing we need to do is we need a, a massive change in how agriculture is done. So uh, you saw that picture um, in a previous slide of, of the, I'll just flip back to the, the sorts of agriculture we're used to large scale fossil fuel intensive agriculture using lots of uh, herbicides and pesticides uh, and things like that to most of which are fossil fuel derived as well having a uh, massive impact on ecological systems uh, increasingly we're learning impacts on human health but also shaping the sort of food we have and the quality of food we have and uh, so we've seen a, a significant reduction in the nutritional quality of food over the last century with increasingly modernized agriculture. We are gonna to need to find new ways of practicing agriculture. We need to move away from fossil fuels. Um, we need to, in Australia, it, particularly in this continent, uh, on the driest inhabited continent in the world, uh, we need to uh, do, there's a massive amount of ecological restoration work that we need, especially in relation to rebuilding soil. So since Europeans came here, we've managed to trash the the, the vast majority of the, the topsoil of this continent. Uh, our waterways are highly degraded and that has a lot to do with the loss, loss of topsoil and how that's affected um, ground hydrology and things like that. So we need new agriculture and the buzzword at the moment, and I'm gonna use it in, a, in, in its broadest sense is regenerative agriculture. And here um, I want to be uh, uh, direct. So the, on the right, right of your screen, you can see a book called Call of the Reed Warbler. Um, it's all about regenerative agriculture in Australia. It's um, written by an Australian telling stories of Australian farmers who are doing it now. And it's probably one of the most hopeful things I've read in a very long time. It's a, a fantastic book. It's quite large. Uh, but quite easy to read. Uh, and I would commend it to anyone, especially if you want a sense of hope about where we can go uh, and and see it because it's being done. And just uh, the amount of change that people can bring to heal a landscape in what is remarkably quick time. So regenerative agriculture describes basically uh, uh, 
a quite a radical change in how farmers think about what they're doing. There's no single thing that describes it other than really paying attention to the landscape and uh, understanding how it works. So it, it requires greater ecological literacy uh, of farmers. And then there's under that, there's a whole toolbox of different practices that farmers can use and deploy depending on what sort of landscapes you live in. So it, it all depends on tailoring agriculture to the specific landscapes uh, in which you live and what its needs are. So the, what the landscape's needs are ecologically. This requires rather as farming has, we, we call it industrial farming, has tended to work almost against natural systems, trying to overcome them, whereas regenerative agriculture seeks to work within and with natural systems for overall ecological benefit. So it seeks not only to produce food for humans, but also seeks to improve soil, store the nutrient cycle, improve hydrology, um, increase habitat for native species in Australia, which is critical. We are facing a critical situation with a lot of our native mammals and birds in relation to habitat and to protect genetic diversity. Um, and as I said, um, this is not pie in the sky, it's happening. People are doing it and, and really with remarkable stories and with really uh, hopeful stories about restoration health, health being brought to, to landscapes. Uh, climate, uh, regenerative agriculture can be seen both as a form of climate adaptation, which means which we can adapt to the challenges already posed posed to us by uh, a number of things. So culture is all about increasing uh, the uh, soil health and the ability of soil to retain moisture. Uh, so, and that has to do with hydrology. So that in massively increases uh, drought resilience, which, which in Australia is one of our primary needs in relation uh, to um, climate change resilience. There's uh, Regenerative agriculture nearly always involves a large amount of tree planting for multiple reasons, for habitat, but also for shade, for wind protection, uh, for hydrology. Uh, and what that also tends to do is to create microclimates. So that also reduces heat in an area, uh, also reduces frost vulnerability, uh, and again, increases resilience in times of drought. Um, so it's a form of adapting to climate change, but it is also a form of climate mitigation. Uh, by, by that, I mean, it's one of the ways that we can, and one of the really hopeful and under-recognized ways by which we can seek to draw down carbon. Uh, so uh, regenerative agriculture, uh, by definition, massively part carbon positive. So often in Australia, we think of agriculture as a problem, and it is so nationally in terms of carbon emissions and the amount of uh, particularly cattle we have in Australia. But that's because of the types of farming that were, were so the other of a in the Canberra region, uh, agriculture found that. 11 times more 11 times more carbon in its soil than it emits and that includes all its emission including its embodied transport emissions and all that sort of stuff 11 times more which is incredible if all australian farms did something like that um, we would see a, a huge change in our carbon emission profile nationally uh, so it, it, it could play a massive role in Australia's response to reducing our carbon emissions. So that's a hopeful story. We need that to happen on, on a much larger scale. We also need, and for want of a better term, I'm calling it a permaculture revolution, although I'm using the term permaculture reasonably loosely, uh, uh, as well as agriculture, which we think of particularly predominantly in rural areas out in the great Australian landscape, 
Uh, we need a lot of food growing happening in and around urban areas. And I'm talking about small scale intensive food growing. Uh, and permaculture is a great form of for capturing a lot of that. And so these are forms of food, food growing that also basically use uh, are predicated on using ecological natural knowledge and not trying to work against how plants want to grow and what soil needs, but working with soil and working with uh, all sorts of uh, uh, very uh, innovative ways about thinking how you put your food together uh, to produce quite a lot of food from quite a small space. Uh, and I've put it down as small scale resilient and the LAEI means low externally, not having to bring in or anything like that. You're not required on using uh, uh, petrol powered motors to, to do it. So low cost is another way of putting it. Uh, but these are intensive food systems and they um, often labor intensive. Um, on the right hand side that the picture is from Cuba. So in the 1990s, Cuba was forced into a massive uh, agricultural experiment, I should, um, where basically through the, uh, the US embargo of oil to Cuba, it suddenly went from the, the world's most intensive use of fossil fuels in its agriculture to having no fossil fuels whatsoever for it. They had to transition to organic agriculture at a national scale almost overnight. Uh, and they had incredible success with actually with uh, Australian permaculturists help them get there. So in Cuba today, nine fruit and vegetables grown within a within an urban boundary, which is a staggering <laughs> uh, figure. Ninety percent of fruit and veggies. Where we need to go, we also need to move towards greater regional food security. Now that's a little bit of a buzzword and regional food security means can mean quite different things to different people. Um, I probably don't have time to go into the, uh, the various forms of it, but essentially what we're talking about is in, and how you define region, <laughs> there's lots of debate about that, but in some sort of sense of, of uh, space, smaller scale space, uh, we need to think about, uh, but the, the issues of access to food, equity to food, and the resilience of the food system overall. And that's generally what we mean by regional food security. We've just seen through COVID, but I think increasingly with climate change, we can't presume upon the free global flow of food anymore. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be still international trade of food. There will be, and I think there still needs to be. We need to still, food will need to move across boundaries. And that's not a bad thing. But we can't presume upon it on the way we have for the last 100, well, 150 years now, really. Um, we're going to have to think differently about our food systems. And you can see uh, there's lots of people, including in Gippsland, uh, already one trying to think about food at a regional scale and what that means. Where we need to go. Um, so... We need to have massive changes in farming uh, and sustainable farming needs that we mean need to sustain farmers, which is uh, seems pretty simple, but a point we are massively missing in Australia. So one of the biggest crises face, facing uh, agriculture in Australia is a succession crisis. The average age of your Australian farmer is 58 years old, and that's getting older each year. Uh, uh, the children are not staying on farms and older farmers are increasingly walking off. And that's because it's so hard and so unrewarding, both economically rewarding. So there's lots of farmers today in Australia managing million dollar economies for basically taking home at the end the equivalent, equivalent of Centrelink incomes. Uh, and that's with in, working incredibly long hours, very difficult to get a holiday, very difficult, isolated, often on their own. Um, you can see why why the younger uh, generations aren't taking following their parents in those the, the footsteps. Sustaining sustainable farmers need mean we need to make it sustainable for the farmers themselves, and farmers are people too, which means they need to be in contact with other people. They need to go to the shops. They need to be able to go to the bank. They want to play footy, go to a church, play bingo. 
That means farmers need rural communities. So sustain, sustainable farming requires reinvigorating rural communities. Uh, and that's something we need to think hard about in Australia. Uh, and that's largely an economic task, but not just an economic task. It's also a cultural and mindset task about how we think about the whole urban rural thing. Okay. Um, so here's the big economic challenge, and there's a, a picture of um, Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe thinking hard about the challenges of <laughs> economics. Um, so these are some of the things we need to think about. We increasingly, to, to make farming more remunerative for far farmers and to encourage them towards better forms of agriculture, we need to think about some forms of ecological payments. Again, this is a controversial issue. Um, there's different, and I have different thoughts on it, but the sorts of things we're talking about are biodiversity credits, which already exist at some level, uh, uh, but we could probably do a lot more with, and things like soil carbon credits, uh, which have not really come on yet in a big way. Some of the earliest projects around that have actually been in G Gippsland, uh, and it's, it's showing some promise there, but that could make a big, uh, difference to farm economies if we are paying farmers to draw down carbon uh, that could be one way we respond to um, our need to reduce emissions in this country uh, ultimately though to make farming sustainable for farmers and also to allow them to be more uh, regenerative in their practices that ultimately requires we're going to need to reduce farm sizes somehow or another uh, so farm uh, what we've seen for the last 50 and especially in the last 30 years is massive farm consolidation where the only way to survive as a farmer is out. Somehow we need to reverse that, um, which we need. Basically, we need more people on the land trying to manage smaller scales of land. That's both for the, the human sustainability, but also for the uh, ecological sustainability. Any human can only wrap their mind around so much landscape. Beyond that, a certain scale, we can't really think about it and therefore we can't deal with it responsibly. Uh, to, we also, to allow more farmers to come, on, come onto the land, we need to reduce uh, land prices. Big, So that connects uh, the issue of farming and agriculture to housing, especially around peri-urban areas uh, where housing is driving land prices, uh, all sorts of things to talk about there. And here's the, the heresy I've thrown in, which something you will not hear any politician in Australia say at the moment. Ultimately, where we're going to need to get uh, is we need to pay more food, pay more for food. And that sounds absolutely bonkers. That, you know, we're, we're in a midst of inflation where it's food is precisely one of the things that's gone up. We're seeing what hardship it costs. I, so I understand all of that. And yet that is where we're going to need to get to have good farming is um, food is too cheap. So what drives bad farming? Low costs to farmers. So as uh, I'm sure most of you know, farmers are price takers uh, and not price makers. Uh, and that has to, a lot to do with the structure of the food system and the, the massive concentrations of economic power within it. So we see that at the retail sector in the agricultural sector in the food processing sector. So you can see three graphs there. Australia in its food retailers is one of the most concentrated in the world with coals and woolies, uh, having a massive impact on farm gate prices uh, being, and being able to dictate those. Um, the right hand corner, it's a diagram of, I don't know if you can see that, or five global twenty percent of the world's uh, so they hold a, a huge amount of over and through their their control of intellectual over farmers also massive concentration of ownership um food man as well it produces the uh at the mercy uh, who they have to deal with. We need to up uh, corporate power and there on that. Um, I'm probably not the best. Uh, what those the best way to 
ultimately, we can see right now at a time of inflation, if you are where we need to get low, low incomes and the poor is and we're seeing if we we are looking at a restructuring uh, our system to, to price food higher, that means we need to think about the whole of our system. Re, repricing food means rethinking housing. Seriously, I mean, we need to do that anyway in this country. Uh, it means rethinking energy, taxation, work and welfare, all, all of that. So I did say food touches everything. So we're talking about big, big stuff. Ultimately, where we're getting to, though, and this is, I guess, the, the rub, the, the the nub of it, is what I'm talking about here is we're going to need to face the fact is in this coming century, we cannot live as how we've become too accustomed to live, particularly in the 1990s and the first two decades of this century, uh, with uh, cheap food, lots of cheap international travel, cheap electronic goods, and so on. Uh, all underpinned by cheap. We can't break down that equity fairly and uh, don't just make the poor suffer for climate change. I'm calling systemic downshifting. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how downshifting people use who downshifters are people who voluntarily material standard of living they else or accept a lower paid uh for quality of life reasons they realize that actually having lots of stuff is is not uh going to make me happy but having more time would actually give me a much higher quality of life that's downshifting we need to think about that at a systemic level um if we reprice food what we means what that means is we're giving food a much heavier weighting in the cost basis of our lives, which means we'll have less money to spend on other things. Now, again, that is political heresy. <laughs> it is bonkers for anyone to say that in uh, the mainstream public sphere in Australia at the moment. Uh, it, I, I'm asked by my is saying we need to be poorer. Well, if, if that's your understanding being poorer, then yes. But actually, I think, and the whole point about downshifters is they do it not to be poorer, but to have richer lives, actually. So this requires a massive shift in how we think about uh, our, it's a massive, massive cultural shift and mental shift, uh, but also a massive way we need to think about our economic systems. Maybe, is that pie in the sky? Perhaps, uh, but if we're going to get, through climate change in some way that's equitably or fairly, fairly, that's the sort of thing we're going to need to try to move towards. Okay, last slide. We're almost at the end. Sorry, um, I, I feel like I'm taking through a lot quite quickly. What can we do now? Um, well, um, my first point there is um, about choosing the future now. It's um, my really one way of thinking about the vocation of being a follower of Christ is that we are people who live into the future now. That's the, the whole meaning of kingdom come. Uh, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians is, is that if anyone is in Christ, new creation. We are living into new creation now. Uh, and that's part of the meaning of who we are. Uh, the people who live in the midst of the kingdom or a new Jerusalem uh, now we live uh, the future in the present. So that we need to begin making the choices that I've just I've just been describing in our own lives, in our own communities and modeling them. Um, uh, so there's all sorts of different ways we can do that. Firstly, I think we just need to be doing a, a little bit what we're doing tonight or what you, what you may already do is to just talk about and dream about the food system with people. Uh, I think we need to be people who are practicing downshifting somehow. Um, I don't want to define that too tightly, but somehow moving in the other direction from the Australian norm, which is the expectation of more and more. I think it's great to grow your own food. Um, be people trying it at, in some way, however small. Um, 
not just because, well, if it can make a quite a significant contribution to your bottom line and to your own food resilience in your household, also to your local communities, people growing their own food. But actually, I, I think its biggest virtue is just trying to grow your own food and and how hard that is, is something that helps us be much more co conscious of the challenges of agriculture and farming uh, and place a much higher value on it if we have some experience with growing food ourselves. Uh, there's a whole lot of practices around what I'm calling careful consumption. People might call it ethical consumption or sustainable consumption, which is trying to choose food, uh, which has been grown by trying to support good agriculture through how we purchase food. So um, that might be by buying organic uh, food. It needn't always be organic, it might be locally uh, through farmers markets. Uh, there are all sorts of different ways, uh, food that's got less transport miles in it. Uh, less packaging, all sorts of stuff. You could do a whole session on just on consumption. Another thing I think which is really important, perhaps perhaps one of the most important, is to begin organising around food issues in some way. Um, so little food cops, so I've, the pictures I've included are part of, uh, from a food cop we're part of when we lived in Footscray. Um, and they're great ways of actually helping everybody's bottom line. We bought organic None of us, we all people are living on low incomes and we got together to buy organic food, fruit and veggie, which we couldn't afford uh, on our own, but by banding together, we could. Uh, and it was a um, great social uh, uh, activity, but also really raised our consciousness around food, food issues. Uh, food cooperatives are good. Uh, food pantries in local churches can be important around, particularly around it addressing food insecurity for the poor in your neighbourhoods, things like that. There's all sorts of ways we can organise around food issues, including, and, and I think an important thing to think about, is trying somehow to build urban-rural connections and alliances. Um, one of the most disastrous things we've had in Australia is uh, the division between farmers and greenies. Uh, when uh, in this coming century, they really need to be on the same page. Uh, and understanding that we have the same interests. Uh, we need to find ways of rural people, uh, urban people understanding and feeling a stake in what happens on the land, uh, play, giving much higher respect to what farmers are trying to do and find ways of doing that. Uh, the, the more human connection there is between urban and rural areas, that the, the better that will be. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff I've thrown at you. I'm going to stop and allow you to throw whatever you like at me uh, in the remaining time. And um, I'll be interested to see what your thoughts are. Um, if you've found my heresy a bit too scandalous, that's fine too. Um, but let's see what happens. Shall I, um, Libby, shall I keep this slide up? Do you think that's helpful or shall uh -huh. I? Take down the screen sharing now. Um, I perhaps just uh, maybe bring the screen down and then see the okay. range of people who are. Thank you. Um, there's, and you probably haven't been shooting and concentrating and speaking, but sparked uh, some wonderful thinking um, um, amongst here yeah, now. There's it's going to. Through, um, the um, so if anybody uh, has a particular question they uh, would like to throw in first, um, just if you can give me an indication. Um, thanks. Microphone, please. Sorry, Alex, we're unable to hear you. You'll need to unmute your microphone. Thank you. Dairy farmer, and we had to sell, couldn't get to five cows, which is awfully sad. So I, I believe to really a farming is more and more intensive and productive. You know, bigger bigger farms more more production per farm bringing in feed etc cetera, etc cetera. your thoughts 
Sure. Uh, and uh, thanks, Alex. Um, and yeah, obviously you've been uh, in in the thick of it. Uh, and look, that's the that's a that is the conventional uh, story. So that's uh, most people are saying that. That's so uh, I'm I'm very clear. That, so that is uh, the general understanding of that farming needs um, and more more mechanization, more inputs, um, and so on. Um, I so what I, I'm trying to argue is that the way the world is moving uh, in terms of climate change and how that's going to unfold and how that impacts our economic systems, our ability to sustain those things, but also, so so I'm talking. There's two th things to think about. Well, more than that, really, but the the ecological change feet in Australia on this continent, which is uh, quite stark and very rapid. And then there's also the massive disruptions and changes that are happening in human economic systems as well. And those things are going to play out together. So I'm I'm arguing actually that particularly taken together, we, we're not going to be able to sustain that conventional story. It, it, even just to ecologically, we can't sustain it, let alone the economic systems uh, that have been required. So they have, without getting into it, they've been underpinned by... Uh, essentially a multilateral economic uh, trading regime that's been underpinned by certain power arrangements, uh, those are breaking down in this century. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, I mean, this is controversial. I have to clear so, and so not just my think those systems are not going to be able to continue to happen how they are. And I also take your point um, as not just in you're struggling to get labour, and that's the story uh, all over Australia at the moment. And that's a big issue: uh, how we think about labour and uh, and what's happening in the labour force. Uh, again, so that I, and that didn't come up in my talk, but um, we, that's one of the big things we're going to need to uh, to rethink: is how we think about labour, how that happens. Thank you, um, Jonathan. Um, thank you for summarising some really um, functional ideas for churches. Um, I see Denise has your is that a hand up, Denise? Did you want to ask a question? Oh, <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, and there were some other uh, comments um, sort of through the the, the chat around um, um, learning to cook. You know, knowing how to cook, eating together. Um, learning how to grow, supporting um, people as they're ageing to be able to manage gardening um, and through methods that don't require the physical digging and the, the labour of of, uh, of that kind of gardening. Um, there's been comments and observations around chickens in the backyard and um, the, the bio um, health of soil, uh, all of those things to enrich food and to do better. Do you see that as a viable way for churches to talk to their communities and to model and um, encourage people to build their skills. Uh, so you mean by uh, basically more practice of gardening and growing chickens and things oh, like that? Yeah, yeah. I think I think you know some practical um, exposure and uh, some intentional conversation. Oh, absolutely. I think that's the best way. And even uh, so, I think. You know, really uh, starting rather than, you know, the pro one of the problems with climate change is when we come at it from a top level big issue, it's clouded by so much cultural and political stuff that, you know, people react to it. But actually, when you start from the base level of growing food in a garden and looking to share it and use it, uh, that changes how, how people relate and talk together when that's what if you're, you're doing together in some way uh, around food and then you're talking about the talking about the weather uh, all sorts of things and then you're talking about who's got food and who's not got it all sorts of things uh, I think it's a really practical way at a local level to begin uh, uh, get and making the connection between soil health and food which is just foundational which we just don't still get at the at the big picture that uh, we we are all fundamentally invested in soil health, whether we like it, know it or not. And to, for the more of us that understand it, the better. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I think Edie has a question and then Jen. 
a, probably maybe not a question, but a comment. Um, I, I think that um, that there's two that we're pulling in two different directions that society at the moment is pulling in two different directions. One is that from a very um, survival and, and surviving well, we need to be more co op you know, we, we need to work not just between and the environment goodness that we have. So much of our structural society is is pushing people towards individualism mm. and money is is accumulated by individuals and people mm. are paid individual amounts and um and so i think there's a bit of a dichotomy going on there and and until we can can grasp that the way we relate together as people and the way we're held together as people and obviously i'm coming from a christian perspective there um then everything else is kind of tacked on you know um, a more a holistic picture of, of changing life and changing the pack and right. for that to flow through the way we eat and the way we garden and the way we share and the way we live and the way we use money both both cash and and good you know sort of the wealth of the land mm. that's all mm. thank you Edie yes. Jan did you want to continue with your question um mine's well, on a different um, whether the world can can feed eight billion people without fossil fuels. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Jan, and that's quite a common so a quite common statement of the conventional, uh, uh, particularly the agribusiness industry, is that you need us to feed the world, especially uh, a world of growing population. Look. Very simply, I think it, there's so much evidence now non-fossil uh, fuel-based forms of agriculture can be as productive uh, as uh, as fossil fuel-based uh, systems. But and and the undoubtable part of it is are definitely more resilient, uh, both economically resilient and climate resilient. Uh, so if, if we uh, you can make a strong case in the reverse to say that in the in the coming century we are not going to be able to feed the world by doing agriculture the same way that we've been doing it. Uh, and we need, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, feeding the world, we need uh, to, to to change our systems. Uh, but if it's just about quantity, so even just a, on, so usually we're 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 um, we're sold these pictures of vast quantity that can come from uh, intensive. Uh, industrial agriculture uh, and on some you know in some sorts of forms that's been true but actually in the best regenerative or forms as productive uh, literal quantities of food I see Alex disagrees but <laughs> uh, we, we can, a lot of material that um can I comment? My brother was Australia's biggest organic dairy farm farmer. He milked he milked five hundred cows on two thousand acres. I milked five hundred cows on three hundred and twenty, and produced double the production. Mm. There you go. Sure, that's that's one story though, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Um, can I just say hello to everybody and um, let you know how fascinating this conversation is? I'm actually gate crashing from the UK at the invitation of my mother. Um, oh. I'm wow. um, I am heavily involved with the slow food movement, and I'm also um, involved with the Open Food Network in the UK. Um, this is a really important conversation, and it's happening across. Um, and what is that we need um I use the analogy food system and the food system that Jonathan's talking about is a yacht and it has the ability much faster pace and move, which is what we desperately need to do than the current system 
but we will only do that if we have an Attila. Um, and so therefore every bit that we can do on a personal level to support those people who can do it on a larger level um, is essential. Um, and, and it's, and it's, it's, um, uh, I'm just starting a composting pilot um, that is classified as a food waste pilot um, in the city of Birmingham in the UK. So we're, we're, we're working in, in a, a, a ward in the UK that is sixth in the highest deprivation um, uh, of, of the country. And um, we are wanting to test community gardening and food and, and changing um, food practices through encouraging people to compost. And we're looking at it um, by teaching them to garden, teaching them to cook, um, teaching them effective ways to compost rather than just sticking things in a bin and leaving it and sit there for 12 months and think, why hasn't that done anything? Um, and what we want to be able to do is enable those communities to find the extra money to support better food production. Um, um, what, um, and um, it will be the unexpected consequence of that is that we're creating resilient communities. So um, I, I can just encourage you all to, um, to think exactly what Jonathan has said and, and um, walk, walk those 10 metres a day. Do not think about the fact that you've got a marathon to run. Just walk 10 metres every day. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. There, there was another comment too um, about um, supporting. So Gippsland is a is a food bowl of Victor of, of the of the nation, um, and the Kate, it might be one of yours um, about how do churches support their farming community? What have you seen work, Jonathan? That you um... there's lots of important. And farmers might use it with their land that um uh so i've seen i think this is something that could happen on a much bigger scale uh churches of organizing people so food co-ops of getting people to uh, uh pr practice what we've called sorry the terms just out of my head for supporting community uh, supported com agriculture community supported agriculture thank you but what where you basically make uh you have groups of people who make commitments to support either a farm or groups of farmers to purchase food uh, you essentially uh build a, a relationship to to buy food off them over time and churches and their networks are excellent base hubs for organizing those sorts of communities. Uh, so I think they're, they're great places to start. And uh, particularly in Gippsland, in a country where there's going to be farmers in churches, something, uh, you know, to, to make use of. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. I think we've probably... Um, Kat, uh, covered the breadth of questions. Have I missed anything important? From Kath Connolly is putting a hand up there. I oh, sorry, Kath, go for it. Just, just very quickly to say, um, not to make assumptions that people know about these sort of thing, uh, even how to cook food. I, I volunteer two days a week at a food bank and I had a client on Monday who didn't know you could cook. He only has a microwave. He couch surfs and he's a microwave. He didn't know you could cook potatoes in a microwave and his life changed when I taught him how to do that. So, so mm -hmm. not to make assumptions that people know how to compass, that they know how to cook, that they know how to do things that many of us might take for granted. And maybe parishes can be involved with that really local hands-on thing of teaching people to cook potatoes in microwaves. Yeah. That got yeah. to eat, rather than buying pre-packaged food because you don't know how to cook a potato. Mm. Mm. Yep. And we're, we're often equipped with um, some facilities and spaces to sit and eat together. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, 
Uh, so with, oh, yes, Bishop. Thanks, Libby. Just um, to follow up about not making assumptions, I, I think that for those of us who come from a faith perspective of this issue, not to make assumptions about um, the the kind of, you know, the extent to which people are, are wrestling with this theologically or biblically. Um, you know, Jonathan, you started with a quote from Jeremy. Um, fantastic done in this space, but and that that readily available to people or people are engaged to do a heap more biblical on these issues. Oh, massively more is my my view. Uh, so my view of the uh, how we read the Bible ecologically is is well mostly we don't uh, uh, is my experience uh, and um yeah there's a lot of such a uh, as you said such a rich resource actually there's so much there to be tapped into both uh in one connecting to what is an ancient agrarian worldview and just what that opens up but actually i think that the fundamental ideas of the biblical message and who we are as human beings what is important in life uh what our vocation is as human beings uh and our relationship to the rest of creation what god's intention is for us in our relationships to each other and the earth uh and where that's all story and it's moves towards all those are so relevant they're so critical to about now mm. how much are we need that area i reckon yes um i see cynthia's hands but tonight i just um questions and we have time for so um jan i just i might call, go to you just uh cynthia if you have a question would you mind emailing it to us we can follow that up in and for anybody else too if you have more questions and points please send them through to me um we can bring that back together and um and uh share that back to you um so jen back to you thank you everybody for your questions and thank you so much jonathan um pleasure thank you to all who've participated various ways to note and I hope you have all enjoyed this we'll have something to take away from it that will help us to live out our faith in practical ways in our households churches schools wherever we are um, I think we are at the point of just finishing with a closing prayer uh, which is a prayer written by Stephen Cottrell Archbishop of York Creator God, giver of life, you sustain the earth and direct the nations. In this time of climate crisis, grant us clarity to hear the groaning of creation and the cries of the poor. Challenge us to change our lifestyles. Guide our leaders to take courageous action. Enable your church to be a beacon of hope. Foster within us a renewed vision of your purposes for your world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by and for whom all things were made. Amen. Thank you, Janet.